Hey, this is Rob. This is episode 71 of the Folly Coffee Podcast. Let's get it brewing. Should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? I have decided to record an impromptu bonus episode here. I've got a little bit of time before I'm about to put on my 18 layers of pants and jackets and hand warmers and foot warmers and sit outside and enjoy the wonderful cooking of Chef Yevang and Niall Flynn at Hewing Hotel, and I thought, I need some sort of bow, some sort of ribbon, some sort of catharsis, some cathartic event, or some way to just kind of put this year to rest. Uh, Jeff and I, Folly Jeff and I, our head roaster, do have an episode planned in the next couple weeks where we are going to be revealing all of our plans for the coffee program in 2021, which sounds so good to say anything but 2020. But I wanted to just do an episode and not just complain about 2020, as there are plenty of things to complain about, but reflect on the year that has been. Uh, I am on my mobile setup here, and so this audio might be a little different than when I record in the studio, if you're noticing these differences. Uh, And there is no video to uh, accompany this for that reason. But it is very impromptu. I'm sitting in my home office and wanted to record this And so we are looking at this year, and I can't decide if this year feels like it was 10 years or if it felt like it went by in a week. So as of today, we are roasting in St. Louis Park. Jeff is our head roaster. We are launching the Folly Coffee Hot Sauce next week on January 4th. We have a brand new website of the second edition that has a brand new subscription service. And I'm looking at all these things and just going, you know what? These things would not have happened if it wasn't for 2020. And as my brother would like to say during really terrible rounds of golf is that pressure makes diamonds, uh, half jokingly because we're terrible at golf. But I love that phrase that pressure does make diamonds. And another thing I really like to think about that resonates in my head a lot is that discomfort provides clarity. Basically, what this means is that this perf- this pressure, this discomfort can provide a type of clarity that in business, obviously, the challenges of 2020 were very real. They're very palpable. Uh, when everything went down, 70% of our business disappeared, but it created an immense level of discomfort. And this type of discomfort can provide a level of clarity that you only find when things are really bad. It's like an old manager I used to have at Sam Adams would say, we will figure out who's not wearing shorts when the tide goes down. And that happened in a lot of cases this year. It's like a pretty brutal analogy when you really think about it. But it happened to us. Uh, Things were going really well for us going into 2020. In January, Jeff and I went up to Duluth for our annual planning meeting. And we were looking at this year ahead going, man, we are about to go gangbusters this year. We had plans in place that we're going to move our roasting facility. We're going to open the tasting and tour room. We're going to launch a line of office coffee in this category that has not been capitalized in the specialty coffee industry. Uh, And that was in January. So let's go all the way back. Wayne's World style here. So January 1st of 2020, we were still roasting in Silver Lake, Minnesota, where we started Folly Coffee. Roasting in Silver Lake, Minnesota, which is about an hour west of Minneapolis. And uh, Ken was our head roaster at the time. And what Jeff and I discovered is that as we were at this planning meeting, we realized that, hey, if we were to grow just 20%, we would not really be able to reasonably continue to roast in Silver Lake, Minnesota, because not only the capacity, but the the way we were roasting, and also the fact that it's an hour each way that Jeff and I were driving out there every Wednesday night and packaging until about midnight or 1 a.m. and getting back super, super late and having to wake up at five or six the next morning to deliver all the coffee. And it was just not a sustainable business model. And so we had to consider different ways of how can we put plans in place to reasonably grow at a fast pace as we were planning to do. Now, at this point, uh, Jeff was working three days a week at the MBH facility, which is the roasting facility we are now in, in St. Louis Park. And we were able to strike up a deal that uh, he was already roasting at this time, but 
when he got to the point that he was comfortable roasting the quality coffees we were roasting, we would move our roasting operations over to the new facility. And so we came back from Duluth with that in mind. (laughs) Now, at this point, the online side of the business was not a priority at all. If if anything, I'd probably put it as the last priority in the business because I don't have an e-commerce background. My background in sales is like feed on the street, brick and mortar, grocery stores, bars, restaurants, offices. This is where I was comfortable selling to. And so the plan all along was pretty much like, well, the online thing, like it was growing on its own, very, very small part of the business. Uh, but that wasn't a problem because we were growing in bars and restaurants and grocery stores. And so it was just like an afterthought thought that someday we'll hire somebody or we'll figure something out to be able to grow the online side of the business. Oh, how wrong we were. (laughs) So then we get into February where our plans begin. We'd been planning for eight months a line of office coffee. And there is a type of pack called a frack pack, which is short for fractional package. And these are, if you've ever worked in an office, they are the rip and tear pre-ground nitrogen flush foil packets that you simply dump into the, uh, or actually I'll I'll say pour, uh, pour into the office coffee brewers so that you can easily brew coffee within offices. And this is something that not a lot of high-end roasters have focused on because it's traditionally very cheap coffee. Offices can be more price sensitive. But I sense this opportunity that you go... Local is becoming more important. People are becoming more educated about coffee. And it's not that much of an investment to simply switch the coffee you're brewing versus any sort of like new brewer or bean to cup machines that some offices would invest in that would be very expensive. And so in February, after eight months in planning, we had the line of office coffee ready to go. We had the foil packets with a big minimum order printed, ready to go, investment up front, really excited, launch plan in place. And then March hit. March 16th, a, uh, 2020, a date I will not soon forget. I was out delivering coffee. I actually was delivering coffee to Katie over at Angel Food Bakery. And at this point in February, COVID was like the thing where you were hearing about it. It wasn't Honestly, if I'm being completely transparent, I thought it was just kind of overhyped and something that just the news was talking about to have something to talk about. And it wasn't until March 16th I was delivering coffee to Katie and she was like, things are about to get shut down. I was like, nah. And she's like, yeah, like probably today. I was like, "Uh, uh, nah, nah. Uh, uh." And then as I leave, the news is announced that everything's shutting down. There's a now looking back on it, two week shelter in place. And I have never had a point in my life of, and that's not exaggerations, not hyperbole. I've never had a time in my life of such intense manic induced productivity. I had a bunch of other deliveries I was supposed to make that day, but obviously I was like, nobody is going to accept deliveries today, knowing that they're going to have to shut down for what we thought was two weeks, but has turned into the majority of 10 months. But I said, screw it. Nobody's going to want to take this coffee anyway. I went straight home and realized that you go, okay, A and I, it's like my old coach used to say, adjust and improvise. You go, okay, well, so for at least two weeks, no bars, no restaurants, grocery stores will still be buying, but it's not a huge part of our business. So basically over with one announcement, like 70% of our volume disappeared and the manic induced productivity led to learning how to build a website. So to put this in a timeline of how this went down, uh, this was probably about noon that day. And so I drove straight home at noon. On the drive home, I realized that you go, people are still drinking coffee. Let's not panic. Let's not, let's keep a level head. Let's not, you know, woe is me is never going to get anything done in a positive sense. And so in a weird way, I was kind of calm about the scenario with everything shutting down. And I started to think, where will people be drinking coffee more? You go, okay, well, everybody's going to be working from home. So I need to find a much, much more effective way to get coffee to people at home. Because at the time I had a GoDaddy platform website, it was very, very okay. 
uh, you could buy coffee. You couldn't reasonably buy a subscription. I had it set up where you could pay up front, but nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to drop $250 up front for a year long subscription. Everybody prefers the recurring model. And so I knew this. And so I got home and started to teach myself and started to do research as to what is the best subscription platform what are the different platform options which is the easiest to make versus what's the hardest what i have to learn the most and where's the balance between uh how the website would look how it would feel the operational uh, like the operations of it how would everything work and so i determined after i'd say probably about five or six hours straight of studying on that that okay so squarespace appears appears to be a very good platform There's a lot of stuff you can teach yourself if you have good pictures, which we did fortunately already, that you can build out a really attractive website. And then the kicker was that it had the subscription-based platform. So beginning at about 6 p.m. that night, I started to build out a new website with a brand new subscription platform. That lasted until about, I'd say probably about 3 a.m. that night. Uh, I got three hours of sleep, woke up again at 6 a.m. And then from 6 a.m. to not really even joking here till about 2 a.m. again, built out the website in its entirety. Uh, Got another four hours of sleep, wake up at six again, and basically run tests through the entire thing of putting all the finishing touches on the website, figuring out like SEO, all the stuff of like, how can we get make this more easily searchable? How do we transfer website over to a new platform? Uh, And so in in a period of about two and a half, three days with about a total of six hours of sleep, we had a new website built because In any scenario, whether it's something as extreme as COVID, if there is any sort of event that affects all businesses, it's important to continue to differentiate even during times of chaos. And in a weird way, times of absolute chaos, if you can remain level-headed and be strategic and make good decisions during these times, these times of chaos can actually provide unique opportunities. And one of the opportunities that I, at the time I go, I think there's this opportunity that's going to arise is the gut reaction of most small businesses is that when this goes down, you go buy our stuff because things are hard. We're struggling. So buy our stuff because we need the support. And this, this isn't wrong. I'm not saying that's not what should be done. I do think it, like it's more important than ever to support, to support small business, small local, locally owned businesses during these times. But if anybody knows me and what I think about Blue Ocean strategy of when you look at the competitive landscape, if you see everybody doing one thing, how do I do the opposite? And so the reason I placed so much emphasis on getting this website launched quickly is because right away I saw the response from most businesses was please help us. And I realized there was a unique opportunity for somebody to come along with something positive, not help us because we're struggling, but hey, things are crazy. So we created something awesome for you during this time. So you can kind of see how the narrative starts to shift there versus, hey, things are hard. Please buy off our crappy website. Buy a subscription up front, please. Versus, hey, we know you're going to be drinking coffee at home. So we created a brand new offering catered to you. Now we have monthly recurring subscription. We're going to run a great deal up front so that you can get 10% off coffee for life. And it went really, really well. And this is something that is pretty important when you are considering communicating with your customers is it sounds kind of bad. It sounds kind of selfish, but you have to think of yourself in the mindset of a customer thinking what's in it for me. If I'm a customer, yeah, I want to support the businesses that I want to support, but ultimately you're not going to be able to support every single small business that's in trouble. You're not going to be able to eat at every single restaurant. You're not going to be able to buy coffee from every single roaster. You're not going to be able to financially do that on your own. Also keep in mind that there's a lot of people also struggling during this time. And so to have the communication be buy our stuff because we're hurting is one thing versus thinking in the mindset of a customer is what is in it for them. 
And in the case of what we did, what was in it for them was a brand new subscription platform, a brand new website, a much, much improved ordering experience. And so we were one of the first to come along during the pandemic and have something exciting and new and different from what we were doing previous to the pandemic. And you saw, you kind of saw, you saw this from a lot of different industries, especially the restaurant industries, how quickly some people were able to move and create offerings and be the first in everybody's mind of this is where I'm going to go when things are closed. A lot of people looked at it and goes, two weeks? Okay, well, we'll wait it out. Two weeks isn't that bad. We'll be able to get through. But something about this, I, I by no means predicted 10, 10 months. It's definitely not something I saw happening. But of just talking to a lot of different people in and out of the industry, very, very few people said this is going to be a two-week deal. And so plans needed to be put in place that were more long-lasting than just those two weeks. And I, I, I've referenced this in the past that the mentality of good, that, that Jocko Willing, good, is that anything that happens... If you bring it to me, I'm going to say good, whether it's an amazing thing, whether it's a bad thing, whether it's a like a catastrophic thing like COVID. My first reaction, and I've trained myself to do this, is, hey, Rob, this is me talking to myself in my brain. Everything's getting closed down. Your biggest customers will not be buying coffee from you. That's going to disappear overnight. And I go, good. Well, OK, why is it good? What do I have to figure out? And you go, well, this is going to expose the biggest weaknesses in our business. And at the time, by far the biggest weakness in the business was our online platform. It was reflected in how small of a part of the business it was. And to be quite honest with myself, I was pretty stupid in underestimating how important an online part of a business can be. And if it weren't for this year, I never would have tackled that issue head on. And So in that weird way that, you know, the pressure makes diamonds, that discomfort can provide clarity. It provided this clarity clarity to me that I said, hey, our business is leaning way too hard on one channel, this the the restaurant channel, the cafe channel. It's obviously a very, very good channel for us, but it disappeared and it exposed major weaknesses. And we I was able to kind of take that weakness and very quickly adapt. And here's the thing that I think is something I'm going to continue to try to push on myself in 2021 and moving forward is, hey, let's make it so that we don't need some catastrophe to force our hand. Let's constantly act like there's some catastrophe happening. (laughs) This sounds really bad, but the mentality is like, let's almost make the catastrophe happen on ourself so that we can continue to adapt and improvise and improve the business without external influences forcing our hand. And w- with that in mind, when I launched the new website, I was I was pretty happy with it. I think it looked really good. And it had we had a monthly subscription which we had never had before, but even just launching the website, I said this is not going to be the last edition of this website. This is a great improvement, but it could be better. And if anyone's listened to this podcast, they've probably heard me reference the book Good to Great. One second, I'm going to look up very quickly here who wrote Good to Great because this is an absolutely fantastic book. Good to Great by James C. Collins. So it's Good to Great, Why Some Companies Make the Leap and Others Don't. And this book is all about good companies, good, profitable, long, uh, long-lasting companies that went from good to great. And they go into extreme detail of how they define good, how they define great. But one thing that's always stuck with me is uh, one of the flagship examples they use in that book is, uh, I believe, is Walgreens. Is that Walgreens? Uh, they, the hedgehog concept is part of that book. And the hedgehog concept refers to like a hedgehog. When you look at it is a relatively defense. Like it's just a little cute animal that you think would just get like, just like destroyed in nature. But a hedgehog is good at one thing. It balls up and it's got the quills and stuff so that when it gets attacked, it like is, can easily defend itself. So it's so good at that one thing that they make it in nature. And so if you think of nature as business, every business should know what their hedgehog concept is and say, we need to do this one thing better than anybody else. And so Walgreens, what they decided their hedgehog concept was, is that we are the most convenient pharmacy. And they really take it to heart. They will shut down 
a profitable store and destroy it and move it two blocks if the new location two blocks away is more convenient than the current location. Keep in mind that building out a new Walgreens is roughly a million dollars. So they believe so hardcore in their hedgehog concept that they will spend a million dollars just to become slightly more convenient. And while the hedgehog concept of folly continues to change, and I'm really still trying to hone in what this is, I realized that with the the website, that if we are going to get better, we can't, I can't just be satisfied with the fact that we have an upgraded website. As I looked at it, I go, well, if I want to have the best buying experience, what would that be for me? And with the new Squarespace platform, we had a monthly subscription, and that's good. Most people are pretty happy with a, uh, receiving a bag or two bags every month, but we were pretty limited in the offerings we could do with that month, monthly subscription, and we couldn't do any other lengths of time. And so right after launching the new website, took a little bit of a breather to make sure we got that one up and running, but, but about a month after that, so now we're into like April of uh, 2020, uh, we decided that we need to even upgrade the website again. And I'll put that on pause for a second here because April brought a big move for us. At this point, we started blind tasting Jeff's roasts of our coffees against uh, our current coffees. And all of a sudden we go, Jeff's roasting at an unbelievable level. We are ready to move. And so we made the full move all of our operations from Silver Lake, Minnesota to St. Louis Park in the middle of COVID closures. And this unlocked so many awesome things for us. First off, well, I live in St. Louis Park and St. Louis Park is 15 minutes from all of our core customers. It removed an hour drive each way. The facility we're roasting in has people that are doing a lot of like the the packaging and all the stuff that was consuming an immense amount of our time. And so instead of having to be up until midnight or one, we're out the door at four or five regularly on roast day. Uh, it's a bigger facility. It's a bigger roaster. And everything just started humming along. And with shout out to Folly Jeff there are really no major speed bumps in transferring the entire program over to the new facility. It was honestly really incredible. And this took the roasting program to the next level because you got Jeff. He's now sourcing our coffees, roasting the coffees, doing QA, tasting the coffees. So he has complete vertical control over absolutely everything happening with our coffees. And I think it reflects in what we've been able to roast this year. After we get slightly settled in to the new facility in St. Louis Park, I say we need to make another move here. The website is good, but it's not great. So, using a reference of uh, Zach, who uh, Zach Lyman, who's been a podcast guest, uh, he does a lot of digital marketing. He referenced uh, me to Stephen uh, Paquin at Marketing Beaver, who built out a brand new website for us. And our new website, as I pull it up, the biggest thing about this is obviously I want the website to look great. I want it to have all the information you would possibly need about Folly Coffee. But the number one priority of this new website is it needs to have a superior subscription buying experience. And so now as I look at our website, as I'm talking right now, we I think we've done it. It's not perfect. There is still learn a room for improvement. And I am very, very, I lean very heavily on the fact that we are always seeking to get better. We're never done getting better. But as I go in here, so if I'm looking at the house bean, now I can choose a size. I can go 12. I can go five pound. I can choose weekly, every two weeks, every month. And so now you have complete flexibility on which coffees you can mix and match, which you weren't able to do before. You save money the more frequency you go to. So it adds value to the customer. And finally, we get this website launched with some major hiccups for sure that were extremely stressful launching two websites in a period of about four months. But I think that's an important lesson to take away from this year. And that's one thing that I've been really trying to heavily focus on is that when things are really, really bad and really stressful and there's a lot of tension, these can be the best times to learn. 
I think a lot of people think, oh, things are really good, so let's just keep doing what we're doing or even just not try to innovate. And only when things are bad, let's try to innovate and change. (laughs) But... (laughs) I'm kind of going full circle here that because things are so bad and stressful this year, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of learning opportunities and the ability to always get better is something we already had in place. But the learning opportunity of building an online shop, what that takes, what customers expect and constantly taking customer feedback. You can't take every piece of customer feedback that comes your way because everybody's got differing opinions and every once in a while you have to go, I hear you. That's not how we do it. Sorry, but take it as much as you can. And without this year, we would not have this website platform. We would not have this online store that I'm proud of at this point. And so this is kind of cool. One second, let me look up this email we got. And you've probably heard me talk on like what I think about uh, awards. Uh, I I personally don't care about them too much, but the reason I, I do like them and take them to heart, it, it is good to have external validation to things that you're working hard at, especially when they're a team effort. And this is the first time I'm officially saying this out loud, but we just received word uh, just uh, uh, two weeks ago that Corporate Vision Magazine has named Folly Coffee the best online coffee retailer in Minnesota, which was so bizarre to see that we went at the beginning of the year to online being an afterthought, being not any sort of a focus of the business and really knowing nothing about how to operate an effective online store to being named best online coffee retailer in Minnesota, which is not humbling. Anybody who knows me knows that I think the term humbled is the most improperly used phrase of all time. It's not humbling. It's like the opposite. You're like, yeah, 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 let's go. So that's how I feel about it. It's like, hell yeah, put a lot of time, money and effort into making this website what it is. And yeah, it's pretty cool to see that uh, news come along. Uh, And that wouldn't have happened without this year. The other uh, now for every positive that's come up this year, there's a huge negative. Uh, Let's the biggest negative was the thing I was probably most hyped for in 2020 was the launch of our office coffee. People aren't even in offices. They haven't been in offices and looking forward to 21 and beyond. I don't know that people will be in offices nearly as much as they ever have before. And so we, we just scrapped it. But that that's another thing in business that I, I think is important to do. Uh, there's something called the, the theory of sunken costs. This is the human psychological phenomenon that humans are really, really bad at stopping something if they've put a lot of resources into it and resources isn't just like money it's also time and so this i mean this applies to like relationships friendships it applies to everything that humans in general are really bad at cutting something if they've put a lot of time into it and so for us we had spent eight months planning this office coffee launch we had a launch program in place we had samples ready to go out the door we had the first run done it was tasting great we had the partnership with barry lined up ready to kick ass with this launch and after about three months into this thing we just had to say hey this is scrapped like maybe permanently or maybe five years from now when things are maybe back to normal on the office side and so yeah the online side i think could be the strongest part of our business moving forward, but it did scrap what was potentially the thing I was most excited going about into this year. But it, don't keep doing something just because you've put time into it, because that will not lead to good long-term sustainable success. So at this point in the year, we get to like May. And this is a weird time of the year for me because I'm... I okay yeah I'm I'm definitely a, a workaholic uh but the thing is like I'm a workaholic about things I really really like and oh wait uh, uh and may I find myself in a position that I have too much time everything kind of 
fell through when COVID closed everything down. We got the new website launched and in May, the new one was being designed and I was not the one designing it. I was giving feedback about the design and supplying pictures and feedback on how the layout should look and the functionality of it. But the design work and getting the website built was being done externally. And I'm going to put a pause on it here because I want to go back to March and talk about what we did at Phil Terra Cold Brewed Coffees. Because if you want to talk about a business that got absolutely shook by COVID, let's talk about Phil Terra Cold Brewed Coffees, the business that I started with Brandon. <laughs> we are making cold brews on tap exclusively, on tap for bars, restaurants, and cafes. What does COVID close? It closes bars, restaurant, cafes. So our revenue goes from growing immensely to zero. But adjust and improvise. We say, well, the nice thing about this business is that Brandon, it's a side gig for him. So he's still collecting pay- he's still collecting paychecks and eventually, you know, unemployment from that. I was getting paid by Folly, and so this thing could sustain as long as we can cover the bills. And so we said, well, what bills do we have? Basically just rent at this point. So we said, what can we do to pay rent? And we started home delivering three liter cold brew pouches all around the Twin Cities. And the crazy part was, I think we limited it to like 40 orders a week and we sold out every week for like two months. And it wasn't big money. We weren't raking it in and, you know, we weren't even paying ourselves from it, but we were able to pay bills and we did it so quickly that again, we had an exciting offering for people at home. We asked, well, people still want amazing cold brew. Where are they going to be? They're going to be home. Well, let's get it to them at home. And we, again, provided a positive offering for people at home. We didn't say buy this because things are hard. Buy this because, you know, because of us. As a business, you can't make a customer buy it because of you and your business. You have to buy that. You have to make them want to buy it because of them. And so we were providing this awesome new offering for the first time ever. Filtera cold brewed coffees, which are only available on tap, are now available for the home consumer. So we did that for two months until things started to kind of open back up. And then we were able to shift back into our semi-regular business model. Not to mention the fact that we launched in Spy House's cafes around that same time. Shout out Spy House. That's how you know somebody is focused on quality is Spy House was making their own cold brew in-house and it's they do a really good job with it. But Brandon is a cold brew wizard and they tasted what he was doing with Spy House's coffee and said, this is higher quality than what we're serving. So we're willing to buy this from you to serve in our cafes, which is absolutely crazy. And they quite frankly made the year for Filtero without them in that deal. Filtero would just kind of just be chugging along, just trying to pay rent. So talk about another adjust and improvise. And I think this is a perfect moment to give a huge shout out to Brandon at Filtera and a huge shout out to Jeff over at Folly is at no, there was very little panic. I mean, I'm a naturally very panicky, not panicky, but kind of like a manic kind of guy that I I infuse energy into anything good or bad. And uh, they were both just so steady that the entire way that every move we were able to make was very planned and strategic and it just worked, which was awesome. And I am extremely grateful for those guys. And there's another thing about 2020 that I think has, it's made me appreciate both professionally and personally the relationships that I have in my life. Uh, And you realize who you can lean on and who you can trust and who's going to react in certain ways during times of extreme uncertainty. And I think that's made a lot of people sit at home with their own thoughts and their own people. And uh, it, It can be a very good thing and a very bad thing, but I try to focus on the good things, and that is definitely one of them. So, fast forward back to me. One second, let me get a, speaking of Brandon, let me get a sip of this delightful Filtera cold brewed house bean. I figured what better way to have the last coffee of the year that I have be a folly house bean roasted by Jeff, brewed by Brandon, and then stolen by me to serve in my own fridge at home. Give me one moment here. Ah. 
So we're into May and I find myself in a, a weird position where the new website is launched. It's humming along. It is keeping the business afloat, thankfully. And all of a sudden I have time. The new website's being designed externally. The current website is humming along. There's not really business growth because everything is stagnant uh, in the kind of like restaurant, the grocery side. And when I have extra time, I get uncomfortable. And so I said, well, if we have extra time, how can we invest this back into the business? Okay. People are at home. We can't do in-store samplings. We can't do events. How do we engage people at home? Well, let's create some fun content. And I did record a bunch of brewing tutorials when it went down because those were highly requested. But, you know, every coffee roasting company has brewing tutorials. I'm glad we have them now. I'm glad we can point people to them and keep them within the folly world uh, when they're trying to learn about coffee. But I wanted to do something centered around coffee that wasn't like just here's how to brew coffee or here's how we roast it. And my buddy, Kevin, who, uh, like one of my childhood best friends is a very talented chef. And so I was like, let's make like a YouTube show about cooking with coffee, using coffee as an ingredient in recipes. And so the first one was, if I'm being completely honest, uh, he just grills like the most badass steaks of all time. So I was like, let's do a beef rub because that will be good content and then also we can eat the steak after and it's gonna be amazing but he made a beef rub uh, using folly coffee we filmed it it was really fun to film the editing uh, was time consuming but I had time and so I was able to edit this episode it was really fun people engaged with it on social media people uh, it was different from what other people were doing so I was like we should definitely keep doing this and so the next episode um, we wanted to get a little different and something I had always found to be I love hot sauce anybody uh, that has been over to my place my top shelf on my fridge is always filled with a rotating number of different hot sauces and in really great coffee there is there is acidity and a lot of people shy away from the term acidity because they're like, oh, acid, uh, acidity, coffee, bad. But with wine, they're like, the acidity, and this is really nice. So with great coffee, there's an awesome acidity. And I go, well, great hot sauces have generally a high amount of white vinegar, uh, which is extremely high acidity. I wonder if replacing a portion of the vinegar in a hot sauce with coffee would provide a similar profile of acidity, but with the flavor complexity of coffee and then also the natural sweetness of a great coffee. And so I went to Kevin and kind of explained that thought process. And could you come up with a recipe that's complementary to the flavor profile of coffee so that it is not just a gimmicky hot sauce that has coffee in it, but that it is a truly well-rounded, delicious hot sauce? And that's going to be episode two. So sure, he makes a recipe off the top of his head. He comes over, make we film, make the hot sauce. And when I try it, I go, whoa, this is not only really, really good. I haven't tasted a hot sauce like this. It was smoky. It was kind of tangy. It had like a really nice habanero spicy kick, but not overwhelming. It was like really complimentary to so many different flavors. And after trying it, I go, let's like give this out to family and friends and see what they think. We hand it out to family and friends and they go, when's the next batch? Well, you know, it's, there's really just one batch. We, uh, we're making it for a show. We'll, we'll pay for it. We'll pay for the next batch. And you go, well, okay, well, so let's make another batch. And we make another batch, hand it around again, and the similar feedback is received that this is really, really good. And this is where my wheels start to turn. I go, okay, I've got a delicious tasting food product here. It's unlike anything I've tasted in a category that I think is really popular. Let me confirm that. So I started researching the industry and found out that hot sauce is supposed to double in size over the next four or five years. And what's leading that is unique, innovative styles of hot sauce. So I had 
my semi-annual planning meeting with Lunds, and after talking coffee for the entirety of the meeting, I just casually dropped at the end and go, hey, what are you, uh, how's hot sauce doing for you? And uh, Julie, shout out Julie, said, well, we are up this year, and hot sauce is well outpacing everything else. It's on fire, pardon the pun. I go, interesting. We, uh, we made one? And she said, well, I don't do the hot sauce buying, but I will connect you with the hot sauce buyer. Uh, I got connected with the buyer and we had a meeting in two weeks. So I realized that in a period of two weeks, I need to figure out a plan in place that if they decide they want to bring it in, how can we reasonably scale and sell to them? So went out, found a co-packer. A co-packer is somebody that makes a product and packages a product for you using your recipes and techniques. I found a co-packer uh, and I went to the distributor, uh, market distributing who we're launching with. And I said, we've got Lunds interested. We have a co-packer. If you bring it in, we're going to be able to launch at Lunds. They said, well, if Lunds is on board, then we're on board. And I go into that Lunds meeting and say, hey, I've got a distributor for this that will bring it in. If Lunds brings it in, they said, well, if you've got a distributor for it, we'll bring it in. And so very quickly, it went from like this fun little kitchen experiment I did with Kevin to, okay, we have 27 stores signed up for a January launch. And then shortly after that, uh, I met with Kowalski's uh, 11 store lo- uh, chain and they said, we'll bring it in too. And all of a sudden we've got a, a 37, 38 store launch in January. <laughs> and Here's the here's the thing about this business is it it's kind of combined everything I've learned along the way into a brand new product. It combined my insane passion of food and drink. It combined my love of working with people I care about, like roping Kevin into the whole deal. Uh, and then now Seth, who's a, a good friend as well. He's been on a previous podcast episode. Amazing guitarist and also videographer is going to do the media side of that business. We've got some insane videos coming out hopefully next week as well. Uh, and here's the thing about this product is it's a co-packer. So making it and packaging it is out of our hands. Uh, not out of our hands. I mean like off our backs is how I should phrase that. We have a distributor that can do distribution to all of Minnesota and the surrounding states. So we could potentially scale this quickly. And here's anybody who has a food business. This will like uh, such a good feeling is it has a three year shelf life and it's hot sauce. So like, it's not like it'll get stale and old. Like the flavors will just continue to meld together. And so a three-year shelf life opens up the possibility of the types of stores you can place it in without worrying about it getting old or expired in a short amount of time like coffee. And this, looking back on this and seeing what we're about to do with Folly launching with Market Distributing in January, with the Hot Sauce launching in January, I look at this year and go, it's been easily one of the hardest years of my life, but I truly believe that five years down the road, so 2025, 26, if we're still around, hopefully, uh, I, I'm confident we will be, that I'll probably look back and say that was the hardest, but also the most impactful year for what this business now is, what these businesses are. And I think that's true of anything. This is Okay, this is where I'm going to get like <laughs> a little too philo- uh, philosophical, a little too corny, but... I really do believe that discomfort provides clarity and I, prov- I I like kind of believe that in a way that suffering can uh, create the need to adapt and improvise in a way that good times simply do not. And so in a weird way, I, I would never, ever, ever, ever want this to ever happen again. I'm speaking purely from a business sense. I'm not speaking from obviously COVID the effect it has had on so many lives, but purely from a business sense, obviously I would never want this to happen again. But I also think we're going to be doing things five years from now that we go, the online business wouldn't be what it is. The, this hot sauce wouldn't even exist. We wouldn't have this entire new thing we're doing that I'm beyond pumped about. And that all started happening in May because I had extra time and Kevin and I started filming of how to, <laughs> how to freaking make hot sauce with coffee. And so May comes along. And at this point, like things are kind of half open and outdoor dining is solid and you know, it's night weather's nice. So it's doable. And 
in a weird way, a lot of people were still kind of like, oh, working from home is kind of cool and this and that. And uh, the year progresses on and um, I'm not going get, to get too far into this because Jeff and I are going to discuss a lot about the coffee program and what we're going to do in 21, but we had a really successful uh, Halloween launch of our Darkest Day was kind of our, outside of Christmas last year, Darkest Day was our first seasonal launch, and so it was kind of and our first time working with Deneen Pottery, which was something we had never done before, uh, which also happened because of this year. Um, but as I look back on this year, I think that's my big takeaway is... There has been some of the most intense stress, some of the most intense anxiety, but also it has made me realize that not only myself and Folly and Filtera, but everybody around me, that people are just so resilient. And it is absolutely heartbreaking to see how many businesses have closed and how many people are affected in terms of mental health and family life, but... You also see that people are resilient. They bend, they don't break. And you see the innovations that are happening from this year and the constant adaptations and the constant like innovations that are occurring. And you, you, it's like that pretty brutal phrase that my manager used to use was that, hey, when, uh, when the tide goes down, we're going to see who wasn't wearing shorts. <laughs> and it turns out we weren't wearing shorts. And so I had to figure out how do we make some shorts? And that's what this year has kind of been all about is let's figure out a way to make some shorts to make sure that we're not pantsless when this tide goes down. And let's make sure in the future that if this tide goes down again, that we've got an extra pair of shorts on hand for when it does go down. Um, yeah. And I'm honestly just grateful at this point. Uh, we just, got through the holiday season and we had a record month for online sales and the feedback from customers and the support of customers has been just honestly so what is even the word for it like it's it's on it's unbelievable that if 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 you work hard at what you're passionate about and you work to always get better and to serve customers the best product that you can possibly do the reciprocation of that in terms of gratitude and excitement and word of mouth is unlike anything I can possibly explain and I think that's what I've kind of learned this month um is that it's created a lot of stress and I've learned a lot about customer service and a lot about like ordering online and what it takes to do it effectively. And we've messed up plenty of times and we definitely will continue to mess up, but we will always work hard to rectify situations as quickly as possible. And yeah, I'm, really looking forward going into 2021. I am slightly nervous that everyone seems to think that when the clock hits midnight tonight that everything's going to reset and we're all good, which it isn't. Things are going to continue to be really weird. But I I am very hopeful uh, as we move forward. And I, that's the sense I get from a lot of people that we're going to figure out what's going on. Hopefully, COVID and the vaccinations and everything can create a healthy environment to reopen. And yeah, let's, let's get after it this year. Let's just absolutely get after it in every sense of the word. I'm really hoping we've got ourselves a scenario like after the 1918 pandemic, I think it was a Spanish flu. Was that what it was? That you had the roaring twenties. I was like, let's have the roaring 2021s and 22 and just like, let's use this as an opportunity to realize how awesome things are when they're good. So as opposed to saying, I'm going to be pissed off because things are bad. How about we focus that when things are good to really appreciate it when they're good? Because humans were a little too good at just accepting how things are and not appreciating them in the moment. And so hopefully this year we can all take that in mind and go, when things are good again, let's always think about that at all times i can't wait to have a really good meal in a restaurant people that's that's gonna be the end of my rant here Uh, stay tuned for the episode of me and jeff going over our roasting plans of 2021 because we've got some really really cool stuff in plan that 
we're going to get a little bit risky uh, in terms of how aggressive we're going to get with our roasting program. We're going to do some things that are going to push the boundaries of what coffee is currently and what people are used to seeing, at least in Minnesota and the Midwest. And uh, as anybody who follows what we do knows, we like to keep it. We like to keep it slightly ridiculous and uh, slightly stupid. So that is going to be how we approach next year. I will end this episode like I do every other and say, have a nice day.